And then there's the team aspect, which is, um, you know, and I, I, anybody in the military will, will tell you this, that you are much less worried about, um, again, the rational fear of a situation when you're with a, tra- a team that you trust. Because, and es- especially if you've come up in that environment where your first focus is on the person to your left and right and making sure that the conditions are safe for them, looking for things that could, that could surprise them, uh, then you're, you're taking the focus off yourself and you're saying, is there anything I can be doing right now to help the, the rest of my team? And you know deep down, you don't sit around and talk about it all the time, but you know deep down, all of them are thinking the same thing about you. So you have 12, 15, 20 people that are hyper-focused on making sure you're safe and not worried about themselves, and the, th- the same is true in reverse, rather than 20 people just worrying about am I safe right now and taking care of what I need? Um, so you really do get an exponential gain in everyone's comfort level in the moment. And I think that's applicable to any environment. Industry can run like that. Um, sports teams can run like that, etc. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Chris, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, it's uh, very, very cool to have you back. You know, I got to chat with you um, when your first book, uh, Team of Teams, came out. And funny enough, um, right after that conversation, the thing that struck me the most was when you talked about this idea of shared consciousness, and we immediately um, started using Slack as a team. And I said, we need a shared consciousness as a, as a small business. And uh, that had a profound impact on me. Um, you know, I know that you now have a new book out, we will def- which we will definitely talk, but I want to start differently than we did last time. And I want to start by asking you, what did your parents do for a living and how did that end up impacting the choices that you've ended up making with your life and your career? Hmm, That's yeah, it's interesting place to start. The, uh, so my, my father was a physician. Um, my mom was uh, a nurse when, but took years off from practicing and then went back in after, um, I was the youngest of four. Once I was in middle school, she went back into nursing. So a medical family, both my grandmothers were nurses, both my grandfathers were, were physicians as well. My sister's a physician or her husband's physician. So a a lot of medical folks in the family. Um, and in, but I was also raised like in just sort of, you know, perfect middle-class America. You know, we, uh, we, I was the youngest of four. We all grew up in athletics. Our parents were great, very focused on, you know, raising us as, as a connected family. Um, you know, just really all America, no, no real issue. So I think that was the most formative part of my upbringing was just a world of opportunity. Um, my father had served in the military. He was in the army, uh, green berets for about four or five years during the Vietnam years. Um, never actually went to Vietnam trained. Uh, he was a physician at that time as well. So he was with the jungle training units down in Panama that special forces would come through before they went to Vietnam. Um, so just the stories of that was very impactful on me. Um, and I had an uncle that was in the SEAL teams in Vietnam. So we sort of grew up in that under the umbrella of service. My mm-hmm. grandfather had been in, in World War II. So th- that combined sort of the limitless opportunity of just really solid parents um, combined with sort of a legacy of service, I think is probably what drew me into wanting to do something like that. Mm. Now, when you started, did you know that you were going to end up being uh, a Navy SEAL? Like, how does how does that process start? Like, when somebody begins in the military, is it you make the decision then, or do you start out just enlisting and you work your way up to it? Because I know SEALs are pretty much like one of the most elite uh, groups of our military, having spent some time with them. Yeah, the the um, the vast majority of folks, whatever you're going to do, whether it's intelligence or aviation or special operations, you, you apply through that channel coming in. So I knew I wanted to be, um, I knew I wanted to be a SEAL first and foremost, and SEALs happen to be in the Navy. So, and I wanted to go in as a commissioned officer. So you apply through that route, but you sort of start with the community and you work your way up into the bigger, uh, the bigger application process from there. Um, and the seals very tightly manage, obviously the, the flow of folks coming into, uh, their, their earliest selection windows. And then they own the training once you're actually, uh, uh, sign on the dotted line and in uniform. 
Mm. So, you know, I've had a chance to talk with uh, you before, as well as my friend Brian Ferguson. Um, and I'm, if you have a question about SEAL training, I'm curious what uh, separates the people who make it through the training from the ones who don't, how much of it is mental and how much of it is physical, and um, what can we take away from that, and how can people cultivate the, the kind of capacity that people who make it through SEAL training have in their own lives? Which I realized yeah. three questions in one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I just sort of attack that from a few different different angles. Um, the one thing I never I was in active uh, in uniform on active duty for a little over fifteen years, and I never went back. Just never had the opportunity to go back and spend time in the training pipeline as you know an officer that sort of oversees it. I've had you know obviously a lot of great friends that have done that, um, and I, that's the one thing in my career that I wish I had done because I think this question is fascinating. Right? If you could answer. If I could answer what you just asked, um, you know, I'd be a billionaire. Right? <laughs> that, that is the ultimate question that anybody's trying to, to answer in any sort of competitive space, right? Yeah. What makes a great, uh, what, what gives them the ability to make it through SEAL training where the attrition rates, you know, 80, 85%, depending on sort of year by year. What, what makes a person become a, a great physician? Um, well, if you knew that, you could go to the freshman class around the country and say, okay, here, here are the future of physicians. Part of it is just, um, you have to have the the selection to weed that out. So even after years of experience inside the community, you could go back and find a class starting the basic SEAL training on day one of say 125 students, and you could go through your best gut, you know, experience based on your, your, just your intuitive sense over the years, pick the 25 guys that you think are going to make it, and you might be 30% right, 40% right. It's just so hard to tell. I mean, one guy that has just finished, you know, his third Ironman triathlon, all-American swimmer, will not make it through Hell Week. And the 19-year-old kid from Iowa who quit smoking the day the training starts will end up finishing the top 10 in the class. So there's something deep inside a person that comes out in that sort of training. And it's a combination of, I think, you know, the, the obvious one out of the gates is just a high level of, of grit, perseverance, and combined with a uh, sort of a relentless discipline in your own personal approach. And then there's deep seated, like, um, no one's going to make me quit, you know, and that, that, that's where the interesting part becomes, it comes out because that's tied to your sort of deep foundational stuff that all makes us each tick that goes back to, you know, your early days or whatever, you know, I was the youngest of four, three brothers. We all grew up wrestling. You know, I just got my butt handed to me by my older siblings uh, for for years. So that certainly put in me like a certain, you know, small man's attitude of, uh, hey, I'm, I'm going to make it through this no matter what. Um, the Everybody's got some some portion of that inside them as well. So and that's critical in the, in SEAL training for sure, because it's just a the, the initial phase, six to eight months or so is it's a pounding. You know, it's it's um, up every day at 430 and you go till 10 at night and just nonstop uh, for months and months on end. Any one day, uh, you know, a fit person could execute the, the the stuff that you have to do during that window. But it's then you get up the next day and do it and the next day and do it. And you extend that out for six months. And most guys, in my experience, would quit on Wednesday at 4:30 when the alarm went off, and they'd say, "You know what? I'm done. I'm just I could." They, but they could make it through that day if they had that third leg of the s stool that said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna get up, put one foot in front of the other, and make it through today." So there's that somewhere in there is that also that ability to sort of see life in small chunks and compartmentalize the pain of the long term and just say, "Well, I'm gonna get through this next thing." Um, and that, that's something that I consistently saw both in training and the community that made guys very successful to say, look, this is, of course, this is going to be a really hard deployment, but we're going to do this next mission really well. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, of an impact do the peers have on, uh, people's decisions to stick through it or to quit? And, and, you know, what impact does, you know, the community have on, on the entire process of training and in general, what is, what is the impact of community? Cause like I said, I think the thing that struck me most when I got to spend time at the station foundation was the sense of community that these guys had built. Yeah. The, um, the, it's, it, it, I didn't know this coming in, but I think one of the unique, uh, not better, not worse, but a unique aspect of the SEAL teams is that um, it's in the name. It's the SEAL teams. Like you are expected to be a member of a team, not a 
uh, uniquely capable superhero individual. And so that gets instilled at you day one at uh, the basic training, what we call BUDS out in Coronado. Um, and I think part of it's legacy of, of the types of missions. So uh, the SEALs obviously do a lot of stuff underwater. You never do anything underwater by yourself, right? Because it's just too dangerous. You can be dead in 10 seconds if something goes wrong. So when you're underwater, you're literally always tethered to at least one more person. So you're, you're, you're connected back and forth. You know exactly where your partner is at any, any given time. And that gives... Um, you know, you become more more than a sum of your parts, and so the early training before you get into any sort of advanced um, stuff in the water or anything is just very focused on finding individuals that uh, understand that if you can form, you know, team trust based bonds with others, you'll be capable of doing much more than you could on your own. So. Everything you do at Buds is in groups, what's called boat crews. So there's six, seven individuals that are in charge of a boat. They do everything together. They eat their meals together. They they get in line when you're doing workouts on the beach. There's six or seven folks in that line. There's a boat crew leader. Everyone plays a little role. So you're, you know. You're three months into your military career, and you don't you don't know anything about sort of structuring uh, big military organizations. But these are your six or seven people, and you make sure everybody's ready to go in the morning. When somebody's not there on, at four thirty, you run to the room and wake them up um, before you get an inspection. Those six guys are checking each other out, making sure that their equipment is uh, taken care of properly before the instructors show up. So, some people are hardwired to operate well in that sort of team environment. Um, it's just sort of in your DNA. And some people are not. Some people are just individually focused, which is also has some strengths to it. But that highlights itself very quickly in that team-based training. And then the, the SEAL teams then expand that up. And that, that mentality just grows and deepens over the, over the years. So your initial few weeks in training, few months in training, when you're, when you're operating as this effective team that's just sort of making it through every day, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, those have become, you know, some of the deepest tribal bonds that um, I've ever experienced in my life, you know, as, as those units are then going to war together and fighting together and losing friends together and taking care of families where, where, where the guys are in trouble or have been lost. And, you know, it, that just grows and grows and grows over the years, which is where I think the experiences you've had with guys that are transitioning, you're, you're seeing the backside of that, just the intensity of those, those, uh, those bonds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm also curious about is uh, how does your perception of fear change as you've gone through training, as you've been deployed? Like, because I mean, everything you're describing to me, especially being on the front line, sounds absolutely terrifying. I'm like, wow, I'm like, that's like volunteering yourself for death. Um, so I'm very curious, like, how does your internal narrative around fear begin to evolve as you go through this experience? Um, well, I think there's maybe two ways to look at that. One, you can uh, just through exposure. Um, you know, you've, you've surfed some big waves in your life. Sure. You know, if you, if you went back seven years ago and looked at the biggest wave you surfed last year, it would be terrifying, right? There's yeah. no way you'd think that's ever possible. So you can just, your skill goes up, but your ability to mitigate the fear and compartmentalize all that also goes down. Uh -huh. um, some of that is, is um, completely logical because you're just ready to handle it. Um, some of it's illogical. Like a big wave could kill you now, just like it could have when you started surfing. Sure. Um, but you're, you're comfortable enough in the moment to be able to put that fear aside. And you, you, know, you, and you felt this, I'm sure, in that environment. You, you operate exponentially better as a, as a result of compartmentalizing what, you, what is a very logical fear, right? So mm -hmm. if you're scared to death jumping out of a, 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 an aircraft at 20,000 feet in the middle of the night, your, your chances of doing something stupid are, are exponentially higher. <laughs> right. But uh, if you can compartmentalize that, um, even though it's a rational fear, you're actually going to you're in a much safer um, position. So I think that's that's a key component of it is just the uh, learning to compartmentalize it over over time. Um, and then there's the team aspect, which is, um, you know, and I, I, anybody in the military will will tell you this, that you are much less worried about, um, again, the rational fear of a situation when you're with a, a team that you trust. Because, and es especially if you've come up in that environment where your first focus is on the person to your left and right and making sure that the conditions are safe for them, looking for things that could 
that could surprise them, um, then you're you're taking the focus off yourself and you're saying, is there anything I can be doing right now to help the, the rest of my team? And you know deep down, you don't sit around and talk about it all the time, but you know deep down, all of them are thinking the same thing about you. So you have 12, 15, 20 people that are hyper-focused on making sure you're safe and not worried about themselves, and the, th- the same is true in reverse, rather than 20 people just worrying about, am I safe right now and taking care of what I need? Um, so you really do get an extra financial gain in everyone's comfort level in the moment. And I think that's applicable to any environment. Industry can run like that. Um, sports teams can run like that, etc. Yeah, well, I, I definitely want to talk about how that applies in other environments. Um, you know, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, policy in general and, you know, sort of media narratives that get created around the military. Uh, because I think, you know, and I'm curious to hear it from the perspective of somebody who's in the military. When you see somebody like Michael Moore go out and make the kinds of critiques that he does, or you look at somebody like Oliver Stone, who did this entire documentary series called The Untold History of the United States, in which he, he does a lot of criticizing, and largely it's based based on criticism of United States military action. Um, what I'm curious about is what misperceptions do you think the public has of our military policies and, and you know, kind of our foreign policy based on what we do as a military? Um, yeah, well, I'd say, look, I think I think social critics are important. So all all those guys, Michael Moore, Oliver Stone, you know, the list could go on and on. Yeah, I, I, I think they're an important part of our society. I respect them for what they do. I respect a. Um, a free and independent media, which is in a really interesting space right <laughs> yeah, now. And, and I definitely want to talk about that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're having their second coming right now, which is great to see. Um, so those are folks like that are, you know, boundary spanners and they really push us to think about ourselves critically. The one thing that far too many of the, um, maybe the documentary side of the house, um, that tend to, to miss, and this is a generalization, some, some sure. get it right, but um, it, especially when it comes to the military. And this, this frustrated me to a great end when I was in uniform, and I, uh, I guess I have enough time and distance now. I'm a little more relaxed about it, but I still think it's a big miss on their side, which is the – if you're going to take the time to try to explain the general population around, hey, here's, what's, here's the real inside scoop of what's going on overseas – then also take the time to educate around how the government works. Mm-hmm. Some people, some people nail this. Some people get this right, and I see this a lot in the media um, these days. I think um, you know I could name some folks in the media that I think are re- really doing a great job of it. But most just want to get to the the conspiracy theory of you know the shadow world, the mil- military that makes things happen. The next layer of that argument is: look, the military would be the first to tell you that it exists and works for civilian leadership that's elected by the population. The military will do what it is told to do, and they think that's absolutely critical to come from civilian leadership. You know, the the first senior leader that I worked for that um, when I was, you know, moved up enough to start to have these sorts of conversations through Samuel Hunton, Huntington's book on my, on my desk, uh, the S- S- Soldier in the State, which goes into this argument that says, ultimately, this, a military has to work for civilian leadership, and it's, the onus is on the, those in uniform to constantly remind civilians of that responsibility that they are handing and expecting from civilian leaders. So the actions overseas are absolutely critical, and they war- warrant deep discussion. Um, but if you stop the argument at and then the military did this. Well, you're, you're missing the next very important question, which is why? Mm-hmm. Why are we doing that? Who's directing it? The military is executing policy that's being decide, decided upon us as a collective nation by who we put into office and the decisions that we hold them accountable for. Yeah. So that it always stops. It, most of the time, it stops one step shy of the really important question that, that's much harder to answer. Yeah, I, I yeah I figured I was kind of you know thinking about that. As I, I remember Jurgen telling me that as well. As I asked him, he said, you know, you have to realize a lot of these orders come directly from you know people who are in high positions in political office. Um, I, I'm curious, do you ever, as somebody who's a senior leader in the military, do you ever disagree with what you've been told by you know people in in senior political positions and question the decisions that are being made? Um, and are you forced to act in situations where you don't necessarily agree with the policy? Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll qualify um, my own career. So I got out after just over 15 years. So I was a, I was mid management, you know, so I ran units of a couple hundred um, in the military senior leader, you'd say, you know, it's 20 years and up where they're running, you know, sure. several th- thousands of folks. Um, and then it goes up into the very strategic level in the general officer and admiral level. But um, the, the answer is yes, uh, of course. And that's if, if you, if you don't have that, you have really high risk, uh, I think, uh, situation built into your nation, right? If the, if the military is just a bunch of automatons that execute with complete belief in whatever they're told to do, then, then that's a little bit crazy, right? So, but, but I think that's where actually the, the, the beauty and the power of our military, the United States military comes from, which is we have a, a volunteer force that's hot, very, very professional in its approach, you know, uh, capabilities that far exceed any other uh, nation in the, in the world when put together as a whole um, of free thinking individuals who have volunteered to put themselves in these positions. So, of course, they're going to disagree with, you know, I didn't uh, I mean, I was too young, I guess, when Iraq started, but once I got in there and started to tease it out, I didn't think it was a great idea to be there. I can say that now that I'm, I'm out of uniform, mm-hmm. but it didn't mean I was going to say no to a, a deployment because that was my responsibility and the role I had chosen to play. Um, now, when I was there um, or any other members there, are you going to execute against you know elite, illegal orders? No. I mean, that's your responsibility to, to draw that line in the moment and you're held accountable to that. But I think the beauty of our, of our military is that People deploy and do their job, and they do it well, uh, even in situations where they can. They are close enough on the ground to think, I don't, I don't know that this is working, uh, but I understand what our role and mission is now, so I'm going to execute it. But I'm also going to advise those above me on what I'm actually seeing on the ground. So you have to have that that tension built in there. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com unmistakable. So, um, you know, we talked, we touched briefly on, on sort of the, the current state of media. And I'm curious from your perspective, having, you know, been where you're at and having had the seat that you, you do to sort of policy and, and military action, what is your perspective on, on you know, uh, the current situation in media and, and how it's being, you know, potentially policed? Well, it's funny. I, um, I've got, you know, I live in DC, so I've got great friends in the, in the media. It's, um, and it's an institution that I think is absolutely critical. I was a, a dual major in college and, uh, my second major was, was journalism. And, um, I just think it, it, it obviously has played such a critical role in our history. And I have this image in my head of the last, you know, two, two years or so, three years when they've really be, gotten beaten up in a way that they haven't, uh, or attacked really as an institution in a way they haven't in many many years of, you know, the old, the old guy that nobody's been listening to for years of the post or something, walking out with his notebook and a pencil saying, Hey, anybody ready to get back to, to real journalism? Let me show you how this, this is done. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, uh, understandably, I think the digitization, um, and mass access and every, all the things that other industries are dealing with have impacted the media over the last several years. And, it, it has become around just fast distribution of sound bites and, you know, long form thoughtful journalism has, there's been a gap there. I mean, there's been some outlets that have remained focused on it, but it certainly hasn't been the norm uh, for the last five, six years or so. And now I think they're back in an environment where people are saying, whoa, this is really complex and we have to get our act together and thoughtfully connect the dots here in a way that we haven't seen for 
a few generations. Um, and so I think there's a rebirth of, of the media that's going to help us all. What, no matter what side you're on, this is not that's not a political statement. Yeah. But a but a very a very focused media who holds itself accountable to accuracy, and who isn't afraid to invest in long form journalism and research, which isn't I'm not talking about a long article, I'm talking about months or years of developments to really understand what's happening in the world and informing people clearly about that, that makes us a much better nation um, as, as a result. So I'm excited to see what's going on, but I also think they're they're back in the trenches now and they're they're under uh, under attack, some of which they, they brought on themselves and some of which I think is, is the result of sort of the information age transition. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's shift gears and let's actually start talking, uh, about the book. Uh, you know, last time, you know, we talked about team of teams. Um, so what, what really prompted the sort of, you know, decision to write this book? And then I'd like to actually go into the framework of, of all the ideas in the book. Yeah. Just in, in brief, uh, there was always an idea to write, um, a, a few major, aspects of, of the change that we uh, experienced overseas and what I was able to witness at a few different levels um, inside special operations. One of which was, okay, let's frame the big theory of the case, which we did in Team and Teams. Then let's lay out the actual framework of what leaders should be looking for if they want to go through a similar transition. And then let's uh, talk about what leaders need to do, how they need to operate in that sort of environment, right? So, you know, there's a bit of a trilogy there. Um, and one mission, which was just released, is the is the second. And the, th- the third book, actually, Stan McChrystal is now working on the, th- on the third book, which will be out in a year or so, which, which frames the, the leadership aspect of it. So this is that middle piece with a goal for, for leaders at every level of an organization, if they read Team of Teams or they're just experiencing the shift that we're all going through, one mission gives them a template to map their thinking against. I mean, these, as you well know, these are not linear changes, right? So you can't just roadmap from A to Z, but we try to lay out here five or six major areas that you should be thinking about yeah. as you go through, through this. All right, so let's get into uh, those five or six areas because I got a chance to read the book and um, I just there's so much value in it. So can you kind of walk us through each of those five or six areas and give us kind of a high level overview of each one? Um, sure, I try, try to be uh, give you the, the sound bites. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah. we said we essentially start with this idea of the creation of um, an aligning narrative, right? So this was based on my uh, reflections on what I'd experienced in my military career. And which took a, a while to unpack um, because I'm a process oriented person. And so I initially focused on, you know, what were the changes that were made in how we uh, executed process to get from intelligence to execution of missions. And then when I step back for over over now, I'm at, I've been out for five years. It sl- dawned on me more and more over time that really what McChrystal and our senior leadership did was they created a narrative that all of us wanted to be part of. And this goes into sort of our deep consciousness, I think, as a species, really, where we all want to, we want to have purpose. We want to feel like we're part of something that matters and that our lives are living into and toward something that we believe in, right? And so there was a time where that could just be done at a slower, slower pace, right? Um, the speed of today's environment demands that senior leaders, and this is what really happened for us under Stan McChrystal and others, was they created a very accurate story that that we were invited to be part of. And the story was around culture change and the changes in the world and that this is a new type of battlefield. Um, and, and that story is one that a lot of different industries are experiencing right now. So they, they created what we call in one mission, this aligning narrative around becoming a different type of culture so that we could succeed as a collective. And what that ultimately led to was the breakdown of the tribal barriers that existed inside of the organization. So the difference between the way that I and the SEAL teams saw the world versus the way that an army special operations individual might do that versus you know, an Afghan partner versus a State Department professional all of those are very, very different optics on what right looks like. And I think in a complex environment, you have to accept the fact that two people can be looking at the same problem at the same time from different angles, have 
opinions or suggestions that are run contrary to one another and both be right in the moment, right? So that's a big tribal hurdle to, to overcome, right? So, so McChrystal, they, they frame this big story around culture change that, that, and that showed us a pathway to what winning would look like. And so we were able to, able to overcome our tribal differences. That is, a, I think, a critical starting point for any organization. Then you can get into sort of the practical aspects. Once you have that on, on paper, then you can look at what we call operating rhythm. How fast do you have to realign the organization against that aligning narrative? Um, for us, that was a daily cadence that went you know, seven days a week, years on end where thousands of people around the globe would resynchronize for the first 90 minutes of any 24-hour cycle. That became our, our operating rhythm internal, and that was based on how fast the terrorist networks we were facing were changing, not on how fast we decided we should be moving. I'm using the, the very royal we. I was on the receiving end of all that at that point in my career. Mm-hmm. That, and that's, a, that's an important step for any organizations to take, is to say, okay, look at your traditional structure, and it's built to move on this sort of quarterly cadence probably. Now look at the external environment. How fast are problems actually changing that can, that can rise to the strategic threat level? Um, and are you, do you have the ability to move that quick as well? So that's, that, somewhere in there is the operating rhythm that, that organizations need to, uh, to adapt. Uh, and that it tends to be much faster whether that, what they're doing right now. Then you can get into ideas around decentralization and communication structures that can support the speed of realigning uh, that, that's necessary. And so in decentralization, what we call decision space in, in one mission and, and in the work we do now is this idea of using that narrative and cascading it down into the ranks and saying, okay, if you want the people that are closest to these fast changing problems to be able to move with autonomy, that's sort of the coin of the realm in today's world, but not go so far out of bounds that they're that they're threatening the the strategy of the enterprise, then what decisions that do they need to own down at their level that they can make with independence? And that tends to be much more aggressive. We said in brief in in team of teams, we said, you know, decentralize until it hurts and then go a little bit further. And we go into that in much more specificity in in one mission to actually give uh, some thoughts to senior leaders in enterprise on how they can approach that that level of decentralization and and give different players at different levels different authorities uh, etc and then underpinning all of that is is the the leadership change that needs to take place and as i said uh stan mccrystal is going to go into this in much greater depth than his next book but the argument i try to present in one mission towards the end is if anything, right now, all of us collectively, we have to, and you, you, this obviously applies to, to what we're seeing in, in politics as well, we have to debunk ourselves of this sort of heroic leader myth. You know, one individual is not capable of, of solving for these complex issues in today's world. It's really never been the truth, but we like to remember it as, oh, we won World War II because Eisenhower was uh, such a great planner and logistician, or... We united the tribes because Churchill was so influential. There's certainly aspects to that that are very important and true, but there's such a deeper story around, you know, bringing together different uh, parts of a of a system to make that possible. In today's world, if we if we try to invest all into this one heroic leader, leader idea, we are absolutely setting our ourselves up for failure. And you can see it on the backside, like the you know what just happened at Uber is a, a great example where all of the the blame and the, the possible solutions being put at, you know, this, the CEO ran into problems, he's left, we're going to bring in a new person. Like, well, that's not going to solve the issue. There's, you have to look at this as an inter- interconnected leadership culture and how are you as a team going to start to, to solve for these sorts of issues. So we, we overset our expectations for individuals when we do that and we, then we sit on our hands and wait for the next great person to come along and solve the problems. Mm. Wow. Um, so lots of questions come from this. Uh, the idea of an aligning narrative, like how do we find that uh, in our own lives? Like, is that something that exists on the individual level as well? Like, I kind of get it for a team, but like people listening, how can they take that and apply it to their own lives? Like, does it exist in their own working lives, in their own individual careers? Yeah, it's actually a funny question because I... I um I kid around with my wife that we need to write one for fa- <laughs> this this idea for families. Like, and I really do think think it is because we're all. Um, I mean, what you're trying to solve for there is 
think of the think of the enterprise solution that we say, look, I need I need a truly meaningful narrative that I communicate to my organization that sort of hits them in the stomach. I always tell senior leaders, like, if this isn't painful to you and people in the organization that and it forces a, a hard choice, then it's really not getting to what you want. The, what what McChrystal was doing to us was forcing us to say in, to look internally and say, do I want to stay in my little very, very comfortable tribal norms with my part of the special operations community in my team room where everybody gets along, we all speak the same language and we look the same and we talk the same? Or do I want to be part of this bigger story, which means it's going to be uncomfortable at my small level because I'm going to have to look up and out and accept differences. But that's that's our pathway to, to winning, right? So that was that creates discomfort inside the organization, but it also can push you toward, uh, toward winning. And so I think at the individual level, it's easy to get caught up in sort of the day-to-day churn, right? And say, well, um, I want to buy this house. I want, I want this next promotion. I want, I want to make this much money this year, which is all maybe interesting, maybe not. If, that's, if you're defining success around the next immediate thing that you're working toward, that could be a motivator to get out of bed and run every day and, you know, compete with the people on your left and right. But if you don't have a broader narrative about where that's taking you, then to what end? Because you're, if you're a bright, talented, focused person, assume you're going to get the promotion and buy the house and make the money. Well, what are you going to do with it? So if you don't have that broader narrative, how much is enough? Where, how, how big does your house need to be? So, and that, that's where I think when you, people say all the time, like, well, I know plenty of people that are really wealthy and not happy versus others that are, uh, have just enough and are extremely content and, and fulfilled per- people. I think the content and fulfilled people, they had that narrative. They knew what they wanted uh, out of life because they knew what they were going to do with it versus I'm going to go out and get it all and then I'll figure out what to do with it. That, that never works out, at least not in my experience. I've never seen someone just go and amass all the stuff and then say, ah, now I've got it. Here's what I'm going to do with it. You have to start with the, the narrative where, where you're trying to get to. How do people determine what um, an ideal operating rhythm is for them? That's a great question. For, for on, an, on an individual level, in in industry, I mean, it's easier easier to answer in your role in an organization because you can just map it towards the work being done at the at the bigger level, right? You yeah. just you figure where you plug into that. Um, at an individual level, um, here's how I would I would suggest um, that I try to look at that. And I'm, I'll steal this from my wife, uh, Holly, who's a very thoughtful person on, on these sorts of things. And uh, I've learned a lot from her over the last, you know, we've been married uh, over a decade. And um, she does a great job of keeping what she calls uh, the cocktail um, in balance, which I think is somewhere in there sort of gets to your point, which is what she means by that is her cocktail is a mix of um uh, physical activity. She's, uh, she works out. She does a lot of yoga, um, quiet time. She's an introverted person. So she needs, she knows she needs X amount of, you know, time per day that just sort of introspective and, and literally quiet, like a quiet house, no music in the background, those sorts of things. Um, time to connect with the children. Uh, we have two kids, uh, both collectively as a family and then one-on-one time with us as a, as a couple, uh, hours of sleep per, per day, you know, so she knows what her cocktail looks like. She's like, if I, if I put it all in the shaker and I mix it up, I'm, I'm good. Like that keeps me right on balance. And if, and if things start to get out of, out of order, um, she'll start to feel it and it'll manifest. So I've, I've learned a lot from her and I've tried to really focus on my own sort of cocktail along those lines. And inside of that is my operating rhythm. Like my cocktail involves, uh, some sort of physical, physical activity every day, ideally in the morning, um, reading every day, uh, X amount of time, uh, focused on the work we do at McChrystal group and connecting with team, uh, reading, writing, etc. I know how much sleep I can get before I start to fall off and become less productive. So my personal operating rhythm is, is based on, I think a fundamental understanding of who I am and how I operate. And I think a lot of that stuff's out of your control, which I think it's always interesting to learn from others. But I think the idea of um, saying, I think Srini's awesome. Like, and I want to pick your brain, like, man, how do you do it? Tell me exactly how you live. And then I want to map to that. (laughs) Sure. Like that might just, it it probably won't work for me at all. 
But, yeah. but there's, there's, you see that obsession sometimes in reading biographies and, you know, Lincoln only slept five hours a night. That's what I'm going to do. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. it's, prob- it's probably going to kill you. Like he was, that's, he understood how he operated. Like, don't try to be someone else. Understand who you are and build your own operating rhythm against that. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's taken me a long time to understand sort of my own operating rhythm, especially, you know, writing a book on creative habits. I realized I was like, wow, there's a point of the day in which I hit diminishing returns. And for me, it happens right around 10 a.m., which is why I get up so damn early, because I know between 6 and 9 a.m., I'll get, you know, 10x what I would get done between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., um, yeah, yeah. And that's one thing I, I just figured that out about my operating rhythm. Like my brain is in a very different state of mind early in the morning um, in comparison to later in the day. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm the same exact person. I am not a night owl. I mean, I can stay up late, but I'm, I'm useless. Like I can uh, <laughs> yeah. watch, watch some Netflix, but that's about all I'm going to pull up. <laughs> so writing a, writing a book, same thing. Like um, I'm a decently disciplined person. So uh, busy family. My wife works in nonprofit, two kids in school. So I was up at, you know, a little after five every day for, you know, however long, a year and a half. I'm really focused on this, this book. Go downstairs, have a cup of coffee, come back to my desk. I'm writing before six and I could go, I could write intensely for 75 to 90 minutes. Yeah. And then that was kind of it. I could keep writing, but the, the words were just going to turn into dribble. I was no longer writing good <laughs> sentences, right? Yeah. Um, so that was it. That was my intensely focused period of the day for writing. Now, I would think about the book for hours. I'd do research. I'd read other stuff. I'd, I'd go back and sort of read a bunch of pages and see if the themes were there, etc. But I didn't try to write intensely. And, and it's, to your point, I think when I – because people like you, like, well, what, what's the process of writing a book? I said, well, here's my process. You <laughs> – you have to find your own. Yeah. And it probably doesn't sound that intense. Like, oh, you wrote for an hour, an hour and a half a day. Yep, that's it. But I did that <laughs> se- seven days a week for you know a year and a half on end. Yeah. And if, if you, you just have to figure out what works for you. And I know other people that can write for five or six hours a day. And that's also fine. So, uh, but, it, but it is critical about knowing when are you at your peak to do different sorts of, of activities. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the decentralization piece. And I want to approach it from the, the perspective of a decision making. Like, how do people become more effective decision makers based on the work that you've done? And where can they apply that concept of, of decentralizing decision making in their lives? I mean, it makes sense to me where you do it in an organization. Like, I've been finally learning to let go of, of things that I have found myself doing for years, like editing the podcast, and I finally brought on somebody to do it. Um, and I've been kind of amazed at, you know, how much leverage just that one person has given me. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's 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 a critical uh, aspect to just keep in your own sanity. Um, and I th- different personalities have a different um, level of difficulty with this, depending on how prone you are towards, you know, micromanagement and perfectionism and all these things, um, which obviously makes that, that harder. But I do think you can, you can build in drills for yourself to really, um, force this hard, hard question upon you, which is somewhere around like, what, what, what am I trying to accomplish here? And what benefit am I adding to these next several steps. Like that's a great example with having someone edit your podcast. Like, mm. okay, what's the goal? I want a, I want a good show that people can download and listen to and, and it's, and it's right enough. Um, so probably the first time you listen to an edited one or second or third, you're like, Oh, that, you know, the, that should have been cut off right here. Da, da, da. But me as a listener, am I going to notice that? No. Uh, but so in the two hours you would have invested, you'd save, you know, two seconds of thought with 5% of your listeners. So it's just not worth it, right? Um, so you really have to do force yourself to say, is this meeting the end state? And that's where it gets interesting because you say some some things absolutely, like if, if it's edited so that the content comes out wrong or it's just, you know, you're, you're seeing your listenership go down, then you have to get involved. But if everything, if you know what metrics you're trying to meet, then you can really force yourself to, to decentralize down. And, you know, so, some people have a natural propensity toward that. I think coming, I mean, we, we have sort of funny conversations inside of our group all the time. The McChrystal group's about 70 folks or so. And, you know, a lot of former folks from the service and special operations and a lot not. So we're about 50, 50 split. And the, so we're all naturally very comfortable with decentralizing decisions um, down. And I know at least I, the folks that work with me, I'm sort of hardwired for that. And the, 
it's it's sort of a new muscle for a lot of people to 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 get used to. Um, but ultimately, I don't. I, there's just no way to move fast enough in in today's environment if you're not every day questioning. Did I need to make that decision, or could I push push that down? Um, one level. I mean, you can manage your house like that. You can manage your, uh, your, your personal activities inside of a family like that. Um, and just buy not just white space to do more, to be more productive, but time to think, you know, um, which I think is equally or more important than all the other sort of optimization stuff that people want to get toward these days. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I always hire people to assemble my furniture now because I'm kind of like, when I do this, parts are left over, shit starts falling apart. I'm like, you know what? This is like, you know, something that would take somebody else 50 minutes. It'll take me all day. And that, I think, started it started to become really apparent to me that I should start letting go of certain decisions. No, and that's a great example. Like, I, um, I can't came up in a family that did a lot of like work on houses like built stuff and redid bathrooms and um just it's a way that we i don't know it's just always part of family my 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 wife's family was the was the same way and now i'm at a point where i'm like i could i could um i could redo that bathroom but i don't really want to like i I want to decentralize that have someone else come up because it's not something I, i can do and interact with my kids while i'm doing it you know it's very it's my trips back and forth to home depot all that stuff yeah and i'd rather do something as a family while the bathroom's getting getting redone um so there's countless little decisions like that that people i think should really be balancing all the time and how they live their own personal lives yeah well, uh, this has been really awesome, like uh, as I expected it would be. I mean, I love the book. Uh, it was really, really just eye-opening. So um, I want to finish my, with my final question, which I know I've asked you before since we had you here about a year ago, um, and that is, what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Yeah, I think last time we, we talked, I, I, I think I probably talked about um, you know people that are in their, their flow, um, and my opinion on that has probably just increased over the last few years, which is, um, that's to say, and you've, you've met these people. Um, but it goes back to some of the stuff we were, we were, we were talking about earlier. Um, most of this is about, you know, an individual journey, like most of this, like figuring out life, etc. And it's far too easy and too seductive, I think, and especially in today's world for people to look outside to what, right looks like and try to live into that and i think that's that's a that's a roll of the dice and it's usually going to land on bad numbers right and if you're you're smart and driven and uh you've got the right pedigree like you're going to live into whatever whatever life um you you create inside your head right and so i think i've i've been doing a lot of uh reading and really interested in this idea of sort of the, the inner narrative that we're all that, that, that's layered into all of us at a very young age. Like here's the story that Serena is supposed to look in, live into. And it was created by your uncle and your, your parents and your first grade teacher and all these people that sort of put this story inside your head. And it's at a very subconscious level. And we were all guilty of it and it's unavoidable, right? And so you just sort of live into this path and you find at a certain place like this isn't this isn't who I want to be. So the the most unique people and and satisfied people in my life that I know to be around are ones that have come to confront that, and that's a very personal, you know, in your own head sort of discussion, and demonstrate a willingness to break out of it and then recreate the story that they want they want to live into. And when I've seen people do it, it ends up with you know great positive results for them and their their the family around them. But it, it also can be hard on relationships because you're, you're living into becoming something that others, they kind of don't, don't know what that is anymore. You know, you, you weren't the guy that was supposed to grow up to be a big wave surfer. You were supposed to be an engineer in the valley <laughs> or something. I don't know. Like everybody, and it, it's confusing to others, but ultimately, like if you're trying to live into that story that others think you should live into, you're setting yourself up for all sorts of frustration down the road. And I'm like you, I'm, I'm in my forties now. So I think you're, that's the first phase of the sort of midlife review where you start to see peers really question, um, is this 
is this the life I'm supposed to be living? And the, the negatives of that manifest themselves in all, all sorts of weird ways. So I think people that can step back from that and really objectively come up with their own plan are putting themselves on a much better heading. Uh, well, I think it makes a, a really fitting end to our conversation. Where can people learn more about you, your work in the book? Yeah, so what, one mission is available on all the big distributors. Um, if people want to pick it up and then it, the McChrystal Group, People can just hop, hop online, check out the work we do, and it goes into a lot more depth about uh, what we think is happening in organiz- organizations these days. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.